Good evening, and welcome to this very special evening here at our studios on the seventh floor of the DNA building. Tonight, we will be featuring Candid's second full length feature film, a documentary on the life and work of a very important person, Adriano Baza Pangilinan. When we come back from this break, I'll introduce you to our panel. Candid, The Point, and the Guam Daily Post are proud to present another Platform 2022 debate. Lieutenant Governor Josh Tenorio and Lieutenant Governor Candidate Sabrina Salas Matanani. Phil Leon Guerrero and Monticello Tyron will present topics and issues of concern to every Guamanian. July 20th at 6 p.m. everywhere. Broadcast, simulcast, and webcast on Facebook, Candid News, and on the air at 93.3 FM and on KGTF. Platform 2022 from Candid, The Guam Daily Post, and 93.3 Three, the point. As a defense attorney, I've represented many people who, if they weren't poor or they had received a higher education, may have taken a different path. As senator, I will propose a scholarship for those whose struggles are less academic and more financial. Let's keep our university full, not our prison. I'm Thomas Fisher. I not only approved this message, I wrote it. Paid for by Tom for Guam, Drake Diaz, Treasurer. Welcome back. Tonight we have a distinguished panel who are going to talk to us uh, about the work that they have done to put together this documentary uh, and the work that they are doing to bring us a special exhibit that will begin, uh, that will start tomorrow at the Isla Center for the Arts in honor of the late Adriano Baza Pangilinan, Guam's pioneer contemporary artist. And with us tonight we have his son who also is the uh, co-owner of Candid Incorporated, Carlos Pangilinan. Thank you. Uh, and we also have the managing director of the Galaidi Group, Monica Guzman. Half a day, buenas. Buenas, thank you so much, both of you, for joining us. Thank you, Carlos, for finally joining us on our show. <laughs> uh, Carlos, who is Adriano Mazda Pangilinan? Uh, for me, first and foremost, he's my dad but he's also an artist, a local artist, and a uh, longtime educator. Monica, I understand that uh, you and Public Auditor B.J. Cruz coordinated uh, in quite a, a short amount of time a very special exhibit in honor of uh, Mr. Pangolin, and tell us more about this. No, that's correct, Troy. Thank you very much. And yes, um, it was the uh, brainchild of um, uh, B.J. Cruz to put together an exhibition to honor the the life and legacy of Adriano Baza Pangilinan. And um, with the assistance, of course, with Carlos and the family, um, and then we brought together a group of friends who just love art and um, put together the exhibition. Um, of course, it's at the Isla Center for the Arts. It's only appropriate that the legacy of Adriano um, and the exhibition, I think this is the first time he's exhibited uh, himself? No? No. Okay. Um, he, uh, actually, Troy, um, my dad, uh, he, he's done a number of art shows on his own over the years, uh, but before he died, before he stopped That's right. painting, um, I would say maybe in uh, 20... Uh, 15 he probably stopped for good painting he was he, he started getting debilitated from uh, his uh, dementia and Alzheimer's and and but one of the things that he was hoping for um, was to put in one last art show he was well into his 70s at that time um, and his goal was to to make a whole series of new paintings 
uh, probably 30 in total. He was not. He was only able to complete, I, I believe, maybe three or four. Okay. And by then, um, you know, his his uh, condition kind of kind of prevented him from being able to finish that. So, um, when he died in in April, um, BJ uh, expressed interest. You know, BJ's a, a really a big uh, fan of art in general in Guam, and and he thought it was it would be a great idea. And of course, we the family w- was willing to accommodate, and we basically supplied much of the artwork for the show. In the interviews, and you'll see them in the uh, documentary, uh, there are there was a fascination among the people who were interviewed in the documentary with his unfinished works or with his doodles, they said, when they would walk uh, past uh, his, stu- is it called his studio or his classroom over at the University of Guam, and they would see him in the, through the window of the door doodling something. They would see him throw it in the trash, and they would fish it out of the trash when he wasn't looking. So there's, there's apparently some great interest in his unfinished works or works that he thought <laughs> were not worth anything. Will any of that be on exhibit? starting tomorrow uh there will be a uh, what those were were actually uh class demonstrations um they weren't really polished finished work to i guess display uh but i think they'll probably you'll, you'll probably see maybe three or four uh, now there Monica- were some studies that, that that we believe were studies of some of the work that he did um for uh the hotels and so we found one in the collection that carlos brought over that w- will be on display and it's just, you know, Carlos and the Pangilinan family, they're so fortunate to have this collection of, of, of work because a lot of, a lot, a lot of families with, with, with their parents being either masters or artists, you know, a lot of times their work was distributed out into the community and the family itself does not have a collection. So in this, in the, this regard, the Pangolinan family is very fortunate to have um, a collection as massive as this. Now, I asked Carlos this question. Obviously, his perspective is going to be different from yours. You're a patron of the arts. And actually, uh, uh, Galati Group is a pioneer in uh, the sort of uh, the operations of our Guam Museum for years and years. Uh, who was Adriano Pangolinan to you as, uh, as someone who appreciates art? And who is he to our artist community? Adriano was the pioneer. He was the first Chamorro artist to really expand and live his dream. And to me, he paved the way for future artists. And, and, and I'm sure that like um, in, in the documentary that's gonna be uh, uh, aired in a few minutes, um, there, th- that will be expressed by some of our current uh, premier artists. But I think what he did was pave the way and he showed people that it's okay to love art and it's okay to express, your, express yourself in art. And I think that's very, very critical because at the time that Adriano was growing up, you know, I mean, just a tomorrow man, you know, you, you, you don't paint, right? You go out <laughs> and you get a gum gum job or, you know, go and go to work. But um, yeah. I think what he did was really bold and very courageous. Now, we learn, uh, and actually Professor uh, Michael Bavakua, he, uh, he made a point of this, and you'll see it in the documentary. He said, you know, we, we always learn about the Michelangelos and the Leonardo da Vinci's, uh, but in school we don't learn about at least I remember back going to school many, many years ago. I don't remember ever learning about any local artists. So with that perspective, how important is it that we did this documentary? Carlos, start with you. I think it's, it's exceedingly important, uh, not, not just because you know I wanted to honor and give tribute to my dad, but I think it's important that um, people on Guam uh, learn to to know the fact that our island has an extremely rich tradition of art. There are so many talented people on Guam. And they're, they're, there's a lot of people who do a lot of good work. And uh, we just need to spend more time. We need to, to learn more. We need to do more documentaries such as this. I hope, uh, I'm very hopeful with Candid 
uh, this being our first that we're going to do more, uh, not just in art, but also culture in general, uh, history, etc. But yeah, that uh, it's it's very exciting. I mean, I for me, um, what's important to me, because you know, it's one thing to know someone as as being your parent and they're passing away. We all go through that process, at least if you've been through it, that you learn uh, a lot of new things in the process of trying to memorialize uh, your loved ones. And obviously, for me, it was it was a it was an education. I got to meet uh, people that I, I've never really spoken to before uh, to try to get their perspective on my dad. Um, but yeah, I, uh, as, as Monica was mentioning, uh, dad uh, was a pioneer. Uh, on Guam, we are often used to um, a lot of effort has been placed on, on advancing and promoting traditional art which is just as important, uh, but this is modern art. This is about someone, and, and the, I guess the paradox here, Troy, is that uh, my dad, who was just, born, you know, who lived through the war and post-war, uh, became this person who, who really appreciated and got into modern art. And he went off to, to get educated in it, he came back and brought what he learned and applied it uh, the way he knew how living on Guam. So you you get a flair for an islander uh, taking on uh, a lot of the, these, these modern ideas, these Western ideas about what art is. And, and the cool thing about it is in spite of pulling that and bringing it back, um, to me, what's really cool is, is it's ours. It, this is a Guam thing. It didn't originate anywhere else, you know. So he, I guess, that inspired other artists too. Uh, Rick Castro, Joe Babauta, um, other uh, Monica would know a whole bunch of them basically. But uh, it's cool. I, I, I find it. Uh, this whole project uh, was was very uh, was was an education for me, just as much as uh, it would be for anyone who watches. Monica, how important is this effort and uh, do we need to replicate this with other artists who came after Adriano Pangolin? I, I think, um, you know, as far as the documentary tonight, I think that it's really important that we feature his work in a, in a documentary form because, um, you know, in the 70s and in the 80s, right, we didn't have social media like we do today. You know, and if you, um, you know, go on social media, you see a lot of young artists um, that promote themselves and promote their work on social media. But Adriano didn't have that. Joe Babauta didn't have that. You know, you had to be in that community to be aware of, of their work. And so this documentary is going to be testament to how important his work is and then just how beautiful his work is. Um, and, and I think if we continue to do that, we were just talking before, um, before we went on air tonight that it would, would be a good follow-up series as a documentary was maybe would be to highlight those artists that um, um, were an integral part of the cultural renaissance of our Chamorro culture, you know, and somebody like Joe Guerrero, right? And, mm -hmm. and uh, Greg Pangolin and, and Leonard Iriarty, you know, I mean, that this, this cultural renaissance happened during the same time that that Adriano's was at the peak of his his work you know and um, it's just dovetailing to you know having having him depict the life of the Chamorro depict life on Guam how beautiful our island is you know before the big modern uh, high rises and stuff like that so it, it's really important and especially because we it, it'll be told from the perspective of of a Guamanian, you know, not like um, um, back in the 1600s when we had the Frasinés and the Jacquelets and they were all other people's perspectives. But if we do this and give it our um, perspective, I think that's it, that's important. That's an excellent point. Now this documentary, it's beautiful, it's, but it's just a first part of uh, a tribute to Adriano Baza Pangolinan uh, it'll be a lasting memorial to him. Uh, hopefully it will be played in our schools for kids to see and to understand 
uh, from the perspective of uh, artists who came after Mr. Pangolinan, who had very wonderful things to say about him. It also features some of his art in this documentary, but there's an opportunity for Guamanians and our visitors to actually see his art up close and personal. Monica, tell us about the exhibit uh, that will begin tomorrow. So the exhibit is called Dream in Color, and um, it features about 50 works of Adriano Baza Pangolinan. And um, we were really fortunate because we had some people in the community that supported Adriano at the beginning of his career. And um, one of the oldest pieces that we have on exhibit is a piece from the 1950s, which was actually purchased by the late speaker Carlos Titano. And according to his daughter Linda, he bought it at a Liberation Carnival. Wow. And he, she recalls that when they moved into their house in Nimitz Hill in 1958, the, the painting was there, and it's been there for over 50 years. You know, And so that's the earliest known piece that we've been able to, to gather for this exhibition. What a find. Yes, yes. It's, it's absolutely beautiful. That was when Adriano Pangolinan was just a boy. Just a, right? yeah. Yep. Right. It was just a boy. Yeah, uh, definitely. Uh, I, he, dad, Teenager. Yeah, dad uh, was uh, prolific uh, in, in his painting as early as in high school, basically. Wow. So we have that piece. We have, um, we have a piece from um, the collection of um, the late uh, Senator Bell Ariola, and that's the highlight piece. Um, and of course, uh, Senator Ariola was, um, uh, during her, her term at the legislature, was very supportive of the arts. You know, she, she introduced the Percent of the Arts program, which Adriano had several commissions uh, in that program. And then she also introduced legislation for the Pre Guam Preservation Trust and also so the uh, Guam Council of Arts and Humanities. So we have that piece. Then we also, um, um, if I don't know if you realize, but there are five paintings of Adriano uh, Pangolin in, at King's Restaurant in Timuning. Yes. <laughs> yes. You know, That's and so, where I first saw his work. Yes, yes. Yeah. So we were able, uh, the Alcorns, the generosity of the Alcorns, who continually support um, uh, local artists, they uh uh, loaned us two of two of his paintings. Excellent. So, yeah, and then of course the massive collection from the uh, the estate of Adriano Pegolinen. It's just amazing. Before we get to uh, just one more question, unless you guys have anything else that you want to say, one more question before uh, we introduce the documentary. Carlos, what is your favorite of your dad's pieces? Oh. Um my dad uh, did a series on carabaos, um, which was kind of unusual. Uh, and if you watch, when you watch, when you get a chance, when people get to a chance to watch the documentary, uh, Rick kind of explains his style of painting. Um, when my dad painted, he kind of just there was like not one subject that that uh, was highlighted. It, it was just all over. It was just color in every square inch. There was no one thing to focus on, but uh, there are a few of his works that focused on one or two things and there was a whole series of Carabao uh, paintings that he did probably in the late 90s uh, he gave me one of them I, I keep in my room uh, but yeah that probably would have been my favorite right on right on so uh, without further ado thank you so much is there anything else that you wanted to say before we start the film um, I would, and the, okay. the, the exhibition opens tomorrow night, July 12, at the Isla Center for the Arts. The um, uh, hours of the gallery are 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday through Friday, and then 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. on Saturdays, and they'll be closed on, on Sundays. So the exhibition runs from July 12 through August 5th, and, um, you know, we hope to see everyone there. It's a beautiful exhibition. The hours are only different tomorrow, right? What, what, what time, from what time to what time? Uh, uh, tomorrow is opening night, what and time? so we'll have a reception at, from 6 to 8 p.m. Okay, okay. Yeah. There will be a reception. It will be at the Isla Center for the Arts. That's a Dean Circle, dean circle at House the University 15. of Guam. I'm sorry? House, House number, number 15. 15, yes. All right, all right. Well, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, uh, here is our documentary on the life and work of Adriano Baza Pangolini.
Before I sort of uh, settled on my career path in a number of different ways, I wanted to be an artist. I went to the University of Guam uh, and I got a double major in art and literature. And, um, you know, Adriano Pangilinan was always sort of on the periphery of discussions because, um, you know, two of my professors were Rick Castro and Joe Babauta, both of whom held Tony Adriano in high regard because um, for many years he was the only Chamorro artist who was out there, whose work was sought after. Um, because for many people on Guam, art was sort of an off-island thing. Like the art faculty at UOG were primarily white people from the U.S. Um, and so, and you know, Chamorros, there was a big emphasis for Chamorros after World War II, join the military, go work for the government. Um, you know, if you told your, if you told your Nana, Nana, I want to be an artist, your, your Nana, she might, she might sort of say the rosary for you. She might hit you with a, with her Zori. She might say, no, 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 you know, don't wait, throw your life away. You know, you can't be an artist. I admire him for his bravery because truthfully, at one point I wanted to, to get a degree in dance, but that just wasn't something that a Chamorro man did or, you know, or, or even art that, you know, that, that that's not something. I, I really admire the fact that he was brave enough to decide that this may not be the big billion dollar making enterprise that but it is something that that i enjoy and i'm i'm proud that i'm doing it and um as a consequence a bunch of young men after him have also realized that there is there is no shame in in getting an mfa and that that was going to provide because it was it was important to them and they've been able to provide for their families. And so I, th I think that should be the, 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 the to me is, the, is the, the, the reason that I'm so proud of him is that he was willing to go against the, the what have been in the, the norm. I mean, he's just a couple of years older than me. So I know that in, there would have been no one encouraging anybody to do anything <laughs> in fine arts. <laughs> But he was brave enough to do it and, and made a good life of it and, and mentored and inspired generations after him. And so I, that should be the, the real legacy that he should be, you know, should be attributed to him. I've been teaching at University of Guam since 1989. And when I first arrived in June of 89, um, the second person I met was Adriana Pangelinen, okay, professor. I met, I met my other colleague, uh, Robert Chanowski also. Uh, Adriano, you, wanna, you, wanna, you want me to talk about Adriano? So, um, Adriano was the uh, painting instructor when I first arrived, one of two, I mean, uh, Robert Chinowski was the other, but Adriano was pretty much, you know, who everybody went to to learn to paint. For me, he would be, you know, I would say a mentor in the beginning, you know, to uh, to become the, the professor I am. He made me more aware of diversity and, you know, sensitive to uh, the Chamorro culture. Okay. You know, he was my, my first learning, you know, um, uh, how could I say, uh, you know, my first sounding board, you know, for understanding the culture and making sure I didn't make any faux pas. And boy, I made a lot of them. You know, I was one of these uh, white hallies with an attitude and, uh, you know, thinking that everything should revolve around me, you know, and, you know, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm humble now. You know, I understand, you know, and um, uh, it, it's it, it's kind of a, you know, it's chinchilly, right? You give, you get, you know, it's a beautiful thing. So, it, you know, I, I attribute a lot of that to him, you know, and, um, 
actually a lot of the students that he had, you know, become either colleagues, some have become friends, some of the students of their students, you know, have become activists and, you know, are, you know, totally, you know, good artists today also, you know, so I, you know, I'm totally uh, enamored, you know, uh, uh, of what's happening now, you know, for the island and for, um, you know, for art in general. And so in the 60s and 70s, for example, you find Adriano Pangolinen's name everywhere um, because he was like, he was like the local artist. You find like, you'll find, um, there was a, 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 le a, a column written by a white woman who was leaving Ireland and she said, you know, I'll miss sort of like the paintings of Adriano Pangolinen because for her, that was the local, the local art because he was basically the, the main local artist and he was doing something different than others were at that time. There's also in there, um, you know, mentions for art classes. So like in the in the sort of announcement sections, it says, you know, art classes by Adriano Pangolin and like the Barragata Community Center and stuff like that. And then always, his name was always there as a judge for competitions. And also for winning competitions that he submitted work and he would win and then eventually as he became more established he was always a judge for others uh, when they would submit work but um in the i also found because i know that one of the inspirations that he had was paul gauguin and so he went one year i think as part of festpack and so there's a picture in the pacific daily news of him looking at a gauguin painting in tahiti i think I think it's Tahiti, but, um, and so, yeah, he was just such a, a big figure. And uh, that's why I appreciate something like this is because I always tell people that, um, you know, I would say, Angentihita pues hadzi. If it's not us, then who? So do we expect sort of that the Smithsonian is going to be interested in Chamorro stories? Maybe every once in a while but they're not going to document our history for us. We're far away. We're a small island. You know, there's only 200,000 Chamorros in the world. A lot of this remembering, this documenting, it falls on us. And so that's why I appreciate this, is that um, Tun Adriano Pangolinen did a lot, accomplished a lot. And if we don't find ways to memorialize that, to document it, to create media so that the next generation can learn that story, then it might be lost to time. He, he was a, an art professor here um, alongside another person um, named Montville Cohen, who I believe was more of a historian and I think they were very close. And as what I knew. And I knew Montevall before I knew Adriano because he was the critic that reviewed all the art shows, anything art that was happening on Guam. He would, he would put a review in the PDN and he would um, critique them. And, and it was very, I always followed it. You know, I couldn't wait for it to pop up in Lifestyle to read who he was talking about. And, and I noticed when, whenever Adriano had a show, he had the, the most glowing things to say about him, not to mention his work was very impressive to me. And uh, so I said, man, someday I'm going to have my show and he's going to write about me. And <laughs> so it turns out like in 1987, I had the opportunity to, um, to have my first solo. And, uh, and uh, it, it, it was, uh, to me, it was a very important show because it was the first time the public uh, was able to see my work in painting form and not just my logos or anything I did commercially. And um, I remember that day uh, that uh, Adrian Pangolinen came to my show and he walked through and I, I, I was wondering, like, who's that? I was asking one of my friends, who is that guy that he's really studying all my work? He's like going through it and really analyzing it. And, and uh, uh, someone said, oh, that's Adrian Pangolinen. And, and I said, oh, it's, and so I was so honored that he came to my show, right? And I was so curious to know what he thought. And he never came up to me per se, he just kind of shook my hand, but he, we didn't really have an exchange um, until the, I think the following uh, week, uh, a write-up came up because I think the show was up for two weeks and uh, the headline was uh, Rick Castro exhibition uh, and it was written by Montville Cohen. And what happened was, 
I believe uh, Adriano came back to the university and told Montville, you got to see the show. Tell me what you think. And Montville, okay, I'll, I'll see it. And so he went and he went to look at the show. And, and I couldn't, I remember uh, opening up the newspaper. I was so excited because um, I knew they were close. And um, <laughs> when I opened up the review, it was one of the harshest reviews I've ever saw. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I was just like, wow, what did I do? And, uh, and I knew, I said, man, he didn't come to my show, but he talked to Adriano. So um, when I read it, it was very, very, um, it, 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 it was sort of positive and negative. You know, the, the positive was that uh, Montful mentioned, like, I, I sort of came out of nowhere. Like, who is this kid? He's not one of us. He's not the painters. He's not in our club. <laughs> so I was like, I had something to prove. And so when he, when I read the article, it was very harsh, you know, because, because it was more pushing, like, I'm a designer. Uh, you know, you can tell I'm new to painting, blah, blah, blah. But it, it, it really sparked a little fire in me that, that, and, and I always credit Adrian and Montville for causing me to do this. And that was to change my career set to becoming a painter. I knew academia uh, didn't respect me as being a painter. So in my head, I said, man, I would love to do this for a living and, um, you know, be part of that group. These, these elite painters that are so harsh. <laughs> and, and so uh, it was very strange because I gave up my career um, about a year later. Uh, opportunity to um, go back to a fine art school, very traditional classical art school came up and I grabbed it. And it was a full scholarship to go to the Otis Academy, the Otis Art School in the nation. And I, I, it was just, there was no commercial art involved or anything. And in my mind, I said, I'm going to show these guys. <laughs> I'm going to show Adriano and Montville Cohen that I can paint just as well as they can. Actually, my first exposure to Adriano's painting was at a home, um, Mom Johnston's. Um, and, no, actually it was Auntie Marion's house. And um, I saw this painting in the, middle, in the middle of the living room. It was the only painting that was up in the living room. It was a painting of the valley behind the house and it just had vibrant colors in it. And I'd always been fascinated with it and, and um, she told me that it was an Adriano, Adriano Pangolina piece. Um, I hadn't seen or I wasn't interested, that much interested in art at that time. Um, but then I just knew of him and I knew of the students that he's had, like Jose Babauta and Rick Castro. You know, Adriano was really the, I think one of the first people that I met, you know, of, you know, sort of a indigenous nature who was tied to his culture and was making art that kind of reflected that. And his work was just like, you know, it was mind bending. He was doing these, you know, beautiful sort of village indigenous scenes, you know, people, and the colors were out of the world. It was, you know, he was very influenced by the fobs. We talked about it a little bit, you know, and he wouldn't admit to it, you know, but he's just totally into bright colors. I mean, bright, they're like neon colors, you know, things that really wake you up. And the way he handled the paint on the canvas, you know, it would be liquid, it would flow. And, um, you know, I never got to watch him paint the big canvases, but I saw a couple of demonstrations he did of, you know, watercolor for the students and things like that. I pulled out a couple of pieces out of the garbage, you know, that he would jettison, you know, things like that. I, and, you know, all of that was good. And actually, the second generation who became my colleagues after that all, you know, they all owe their, you know, their, their beginnings to, you know, to Adriano. You know, Professor Babauta, Professor Castro even, okay? You know, as good as they are, painters, okay? You know, they they need to pay homage, you know, to the man also because he was, you know, he was, what do you call somebody who, you know, he was, yeah, pioneer, he's a trailblazer, okay? And even, even Judy uh, Flores, I mean, she owes her, you know, she owes a debt of gratitude to Adriano too. You know, the way she, you know, paints all these village scenes and village stories and she became a collector of stories. I mean, Adriana was doing that way before, 
you know, before she was, okay? To fast forward, uh, uh, Joe Babata took leave and um, uh, Adriana was brought out of retirement to cover him. And so I had sort of a, like a year to get to know him and touch base and and you know we we exchanged i told him about my experience like like you and monsfo really like grilled me and that's why i'm here today <laughs> that's why i'm a professor today because because of your harsh critique on me to be a painter and he laughed about it and uh so there was this mutual respect that we had and um and i i attribute that to him you know the, uh, where i am today as a painter um and I, his, as far as his work, what attracted me to Adriano was that it was the first time. I always saw other Chamorro artists like Dave Sablon, um, even Joe uh, to a certain extent, but more figurative, more um, representational. Um, Judy Flores uh, was very stylistic in her boutique, but um, Adriano uh, was very different. His color palette was different. And it, it, in, after coming out of art school, you know, I studied all these these masters, like the Favis, the Impressionists, and and he sort of fell into that category of the Impressionist slash Favis category, where it was a very sort of hybrid of modernist painting, and he did it in watercolor. And it really attracted me, because when I'd see it up in different venues, I'd say, God, that, that's so modern looking, you know? He had a few, he had access to a couple of commissions for the 1% for the arts programs, you know, for banks and for other buildings that were going up. And his work was pretty, yeah, wow. You know, the big canvases and, you know, he would, you know, he'd talk about it. He never took a sabbatical though, you know, that's the thing. He did go off island to teach. Like, I think I remember, maybe I'm wrong in my memory, but I think he went like to, um, either yap or maybe to chook or someplace like that to teach, you know, uh, you know, the locals there, you know, how to become teachers, you know, how to do art, how to teach art and things of that nature. He had a real, you know, strong tie to educating educators. I really believe that, you know, he, he had a, he had a connection to a lot of people. It was very, very hard to catch Adriano at work. He, I don't know if it was just his way of working where he didn't want to be bothered or something. But um, one time I, I was walking by when he was covering for Joe and I think he was doing a demo. And uh, as soon as I, I, I looked in, you know, cause I had to uh, ask him something, I think, and he was in the middle of it. But as soon as I saw him doing it, when I walked in, he stopped doing it. <laughs> I was like, oh man. <laughs> but I got to see the demo he was doing this student. It was amazing. Yeah, it was just a little, quick uh, doodle but um, and that's one of the things like like uh, I when Joe was teaching here um, I, I never really saw uh, Joe do demonstrations for the students he would just like do your work right and but uh, Adriano he, he would do the demos for the kids and 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 they would like watch him with amazement because he was so adept at, at doing these quick studies you know so th that's one. That's one of the things I adopted early on when I saw that. I said I got to do more demos, you know. And so I started doing more demos uh, for my students. And Tony Adriano's contribution was because you know he kind of set the path. He um, he was not only an artist who was creating art, but he was also somebody who was taking sort of international styles, historical uh, genres for art. And then he was combining it with local imagery and local culture. And that was important because, you know, a lot of Chamorros felt, you know, if you're going to be an artist, you need to paint the way like uh, Picasso does. You need to copy Leonardo da Vinci or you need to do this or that. And what Adriano saw is that sort of he wanted to depict island life, Chamorro culture, the beauty of where we live. But he was also fascinated and excited by all these forms he was learning about. Um, all these uh, sort of painters that he's, the work who he had studied when he was in school or that he had seen when he was off island or in books. And so he took, you know, so when you see his work, you can see like uh, Henri Matisse um, and Favism. You can see sort of the color scheme, the joy of life, the vibrant palette. You can see him take that, but then use it to depict sort of a family at a fiesta. And 
that was a uh, that was pioneering because um in the 20th century a lot of sort of what we see is chamorros coming into their own sort of realizing that um we can change our culture we can adapt our ways that these things that are coming from the outside we don't have to give up who we are to embrace them you know we can learn about picasso we can learn about matisse we can learn about gauguin but we can still paint our island and still express who we are and so for me as sort of a young artist at uog sort of and i slowly learned more and more about him and what he had done um he was very inspiring and i could tell that um from my two professors rick and joe that you know they held him in very high regard as sort of somebody who had been for the longest time the only chamorro painter out there who was active and putting his work out there his style is uh one of the things i picked up on on um adriano's style that was very different was um he had an all over sense of of consistency where the the subject matter or the focal points weren't like one thing in general that you could like that's in the middle and then you've got a supporting cast around it it was the whole surface every square inch was almost like its own composition so he he would pay attention to every little area of the painting he didn't waste space so to speak or gave any sort of rest for the eye you know it was all like this this feast of color when you looked at his stuff it was just like in your face kind of like take it or leave it and it, that really distinguished his work um where you'd see his work you'd see an entire village scene where people are bustling and moving and you could really feel the island throughout the entire scene it was a, a there was a, a really uh unique sense of movement of of these little figures moving around and and it was almost like when you looked at his paintings they were very loud and you could hear it too and if if i could say uh that you can hear a painting that would be one of the the artists that i would think of where you can look at it and kind of hear it <laughs> you know and there's not too many people some you look at it's kind of serene and meditative but but adriano's work was very loud you could look at it and you couldn't help but like it was almost like a a moving uh uh film that was static and still it was there was sort of a paradox when you looked at his work you, you see both you see something still that was moving and um and alive and alive and and if you would think at first you know at first I was like when I I think I remember when I first saw his work I actually thought a woman did it because of his color scheme he he did it used a lot of pink and purples very pretty colors <laughs> but then uh what what brought it back to to me realizing it that that it wasn't a woman was it, it was very uh powerful it was very aggressive it was like the colors were feminine but the the execution was forceful you know it was very bold and um i mean i mean it sounds kind of discriminatory you know to say okay it looks feminine it looks male but it was just kind of the feel i got i you know because the colors you you associate soft colors with flowers and femininity but um i guess he was a lover and a fighter <laughs> with his work but he he had that sense it was very very aggressive passive aggressive almost in in the way his work was
When our political forefathers and foremothers laid the foundation for the Commonwealth, they dreamed of greater opportunities for our people. In 1975, when nearly 80% of the people voted for Commonwealth, they too dreamed for a better life for themselves and their children. Nearly 50 years after the election of hope, we have forgotten how to dream like our ancestors did. They dreamed of taking pride in being self-governing under the stars and stripes. They dreamed of new opportunities to make a life in these beautiful islands. Today, abandoned buildings remind us of foreign investors who rushed in to make a quick buck, who then left us with empty buildings, monuments to forgotten promises. We feel shame for a Commonwealth administration that's been investigated for corruption. If we are to be the islands of hope and opportunity that our forefathers dreamed of, if we are to regain our pride in being self-governing under the stars and stripes, we need to be courageous enough to dream again. In the coming weeks, we will share with you our dreams for our beautiful islands. My running mate, Layla Fleming Staffler and I, We'll also share with you our plans to turn those dreams into reality. Layla and I invite you to make this journey with us. We humbly ask for your vote. Let's make our collective dreams a reality in the Sablon Staffler administration. By doing so, we will bring back pride in our Marianas. This message is approved and paid for by the committee to elect Christina Sablon and Layla Staffler. So when you look at Tun Adriano's stuff, what's amazing is that it's, it's, you can tell that he's in conversation with other artists, famous artists from history, but that doesn't make him lose his rootedness in the island. And that's what's beautiful about it, is that sometimes people feel like, you know, if I'm going to make it, if I'm going to do something really big or profound or beautiful or deep, then I need to lose my roots, right? People say, um, no, my, this is the conversation I always have with my brother who's an artist. You know, my brother says, let's write, a, let's write a screenplay. And I say, let's write a screenplay about Guam. And he says, no one's gonna wanna watch something about Guam. Let's write about something in the States or somewhere else. And there's always this tension. If you wanna do something special, then it can't be about a tiny, small place. Um, but Tun Adriano's work just kind of throws that out the window and says, I can be inspired by all of these artists from across the world and across history, but I can also paint something which really feels like this place. And that's what's amazing because a lot of people don't, and that's the power of art. People don't get that at first. People think like art, oh, it's so weird, it's so different. You know, especially when it's abstract or when it's kind of uh, surreal, but powerful art like that can be unfamiliar but also make you feel something which is super familiar at the same time right so if you asked like your nana you know if you gave your nana some paints or some crayons or some colored pencils and told her to paint something draw something she might not come up with what adriano came up with but when people from guam looked at his paintings though they felt this is guam because the way that he picked his colors it's not meant to, you know, it's not meant to be exactly the way we see the world, but instead you use colors to express more than just what the eye sees, right? So 
That's the power of color. You use an excited, vibrant, wild palette to then sort of remind people that, you know, that this is the excitement of life. When these people gather, when they're farming, when they're fishing, it's it it's not a it's not as slow and simple and quiet as people think. It's actually lots of fun. It's actually lots very exciting. And so um but yeah, so for me, I was inspired by that because I loved learning about all of these artists from the States, like Jackson Pollock, who just kind of splattered and dripped paint all over the place. I loved abstract artists, but I also didn't want to sort of then feel like I needed to paint and forget where I come from. So seeing his example and then seeing how then he inspired the work of Joe Babauta and Rick Castro to also take things they had learned from elsewhere, but then use it to represent Guam and Chamorro culture, I was... I wanted to do the same sorts of things. Um, and so that's why, he, you know, he was, he was really pioneering in that, in that way. He wasn't the first Chamorro to paint or to draw, but he was one of the first to really put himself out there and say, this is art from Guam. This is art that represents Guam. Seeing his work out there in like the restaurants and the airport and uh, different venues, banks and stuff, uh, and knowing that I, I already knew his style by then and, and I always wanted to like know more about this guy but what I did know was that uh, you know someone mentioned he does teach at UOG he's a professor there and so I knew uh, there was this sort of aura on on him and his work that I knew me as a measly graphic artist right I could not I wasn't at that level yet but being exposed to it you know, when you look at it at first, I can do that. <laughs> but then when I went and learned about it and I learned uh, where the work was coming from, the, the tradition and, and the, the history that he was tapping into, then I realized uh, how special Adriano was. He, he just had an astute um, mind for the masters and who he was drawing from. And, uh, and I would look at the, the works and I was like, oh my gosh, this is, Adriano must have seen this work. You know, I'd be in museums. And, and, and what I think was ha that happened to him was happening to me when, when he left to go to school and got exposed to a more westernized tradition of modern painting. And that's why it was so different. He brought that back uh, with him uh, to Guam where immediately you see the difference between a self-taught painter from the islands and someone who's gone off to to get training and and um and i think that's one of the things that we have in common where our influences we have a little bit of the island we go to to a strange uh environment or a foreign environment and but we still take the island with us and then when we return we bring back a sense of modernism but it's still sort of a hybrid of our of our pacific aesthetic you know and that's one thing about Adriano was I saw that there was like, it was modern, but it was very cultural. He still had like that island sense, the colors, the tropical island colors. Um, the, the figures were so abstract and diffused, but you could still get the feel for the culture. The, the petroglyph men were abstract. I mean, they stick people or some abstract of a person. And so I, I, I don't see that there's a distinction. I think his is a modern version of what the, the, the art was that we, we can find in the caves in, in Rohan or the caves at Rutidian. Um, but the only difference is, is that it's just vibrant with color. I mean, maybe, maybe it initially the paintings on the cave walls were red because it seemed that there was some red in it, but, but he had the ability to be able to put other colors, the greens and the, uh, the yellows and the, and the blues into it, that maybe they didn't have that ability to, to, to do, make that, the colors then, but they had red. The series that he did uh, in the King's uh, restaurant um, caught my eye, you know, um, I mean, it was so good that when I finally met up with him, I teased him that it didn't fit the niche because <laughs> I couldn't tease him on anything else. I said, you know, when you painted that, 
it didn't fit the space. <laughs> that was the only criticism I get. I was like, yeah. it's so good, you know, but it was kind of like an odd, it was kind of like this round space and then Adriana just put a square painting in there. <laughs> but you know, it, it like fit this way. So, but that was like the only thing I could get them on, you know, cause I liked it so much. My favorite pieces are at King's of course, because I used to, I wrote my, I wrote one of my master's theses at King's a lot primarily. Um, they didn't have a lot of plugs, so I would write until my laptop died. <laughs> and then it was always nice if you got seated sort of in the back corner where his paintings were. And um, I always loved to talk to people about, about them too, because when I first went to King's and saw those, I didn't know who had painted those. And what I, and I liked it, I liked them because, you know, there were some paintings there which are kind of like Hawaiian, but then when I saw Adriano's, I was like, these aren't Hawaiian, these are Chamorro, these are definitely Chamorro. And then as I learned more and more about him and those paintings, then I actually kind of liked it. If, so, if I ever heard anybody sort of in King say, oh, Hadzipu Mentadzu, who painted that? I'd be like, oh, I can tell you, I can tell you who painted it. And so I remember once um, after I had already kind of, I'd met uh, Tun Adriano a few times. Um, and then I remember seeing him once at King's when I was there with some of my like art major friends. And uh, he came over and I fangingied him. And then he was like, Hazi familiamu, who's your family? You know, and I was like, oh, you know, you know my grandfather, Jack Luhan, he's like, oh, good blacksmith. <laughs> and I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, Hungan. I was always afraid, though, of, of what he would say about my paintings, because because uh, Tun Adriano could be a very blunt person. And in art, bluntness is OK. Like when you critique somebody's work, you give it to them straight and they grow in that process. They grow in that process. But so I saw him and then, you know, and then I went up to him. And then when he left, all of the my art major friends were like, who's that? And I was like, he painted the painting behind us. <laughs> I just don't know who that guy is. That's uh, Adriano Pangolinan. Um, the reason why I thought that it was imperative that we do a retrospective was the fact that when I talked to people, they knew Rick, and they knew Joe, but they really had no appreciation for Adriano. And I thought, someone has to be the one that points out the fact that when you're at King sitting there, or if you're walking around, the Hilton or any one of the hotels and you see a piece, you might think that it's one of the other two, but it's really Adriano's. You have to go up close and see who's when the one that signed it. And um, so that's why I thought that it was imperative that uh, we do a, a retrospective just so that kids understand history and where this all started from. Of, yeah, I, I wish that I had gotten more time to talk to him. Um, but I was always, I was always, to be very honest, intimidated by him because, um, because he always had such a gruff, serious demeanor. But I did a few times see him talking to like Job about the, you know, I remember a few times at art shows just listening to him and Job about to talk. And what I loved for me, what really inspired me, because I'm somebody who speaks tomorrow now, but I didn't grow up speaking tomorrow. And I only started learning when I was at the University of Guam, and then I, I made my grandparents speak to me, is that they would be sitting there talking about art, but in tomorrow. And I had never heard anybody do that before, talking about like painting and talking about like Picasso in tomorrow. And I was like, whoa, this is so cool. And that was something that inspired me too, because sometimes when you, like when you think about what a Chamorro is, you think, oh, a Chamorro is just at the ranch, or a Chamorro is just fishing, or oh, it's just kind of like dancing with like a stick and a loincloth. And what I, I and when I saw them, I was like, no, 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 Chamorros can do anything, and you can use your language to talk about anything. You don't have to feel limited by what has happened in the past. Your language is a gift but you use it moving ahead in time to talk about the world around you. So even Joe uh, sometimes couldn't please Adriano. And that, that drove him nuts. It drove, it, Joe would look, like tell me, you know, 
it, he's because he's so critical it's so critical but but i think that it, it's somewhat needed because i went through that and and so uh it's almost like we were all trying to please adriano <laughs> <laughs> So, but it, it, it kind of kept the uh, uh, the bar up, you know what I mean? Uh, for us to do new things, we had to do something. We had to do one up on him, like like when I went full fledged abstract expressionist, you know, I felt okay. I'm gonna go really abstract. Yeah, you can abstract the the, the figures and people, but I'm gonna go super abstract. We only can't even tell what it is. <laughs> um, and and so so I I think that dynamics it, it was it was sort of. Uh, uh, you could see them when I came. They're, they're always fighting, you know. Him and we all, we would go to Adriano's house just to sit down. We gotta go, and me and Joe would get in the car and we'd go uh, to his house here in Manila, and we just sit and chat, you know. And it was just something we did. We we just had to get our like Adriano fix, you know. <laughs> and, and he'd be yelling at Joe, and I'd be there. And, but it was such a. It, it wasn't. It, it, was, it wasn't just, it was a very uh, friendly uh, dynamic. We can say anything to each other because we're all professors. And so in, in a sense, we were all equal. So, um, but I was the young kid in town. So of course I had to like take a back seat and watch those two go at it. <laughs> but there was so much, one thing I can remember, uh, as much as they would fight each other, Joe Babalta and Adriano, there was so much respect between them. So much respect. And and I and I just found that really uh, kind of amazing to to witness while uh, while he was still around. When I was doing research uh, to share with the family about Tun Adriano, sort of in the past, finding newspaper accounts, he was one of the few sort of brown people <laughs> at the University of Guam, and he was in a department because you'll always find some Chamorros that were in, like the education department or maybe in the nursing program. But the art program was for a very long time dominated by people from the from not from Guam, um, and so when um, I remember talking to my professors about their struggles, and then they would mention his struggles because he was at a time he was you know teaching at UOG in the seventies in the eighties, and this is before there was the Chamorro Renaissance. This is when you know. Kids were still like, uh, it wasn't cool to speak Chamorro. It wasn't, you know, there was no Chamorro dance like we know nowadays. There was still a lot of issues with like pride, not feeling proud in local things. And so I can only imagine then sort of what his experience was like. And that sort of, he's an artistic pioneer, but at the University of Guam too, he's an educational pioneer because he was in there in an institution which I imagine was not particularly friendly to him. Because even when I would go through some of the, the articles which would mention him, you know, uh, UOG would like honor all these new professors which were coming from the States and then they would just kind of mention the local Chamorro professors like with one sentence. But they wouldn't honor them because they were from Guam. So they can't matter that much. And so I, I can imagine that he faced a lot of challenges in that regard and one of the things that i that i lament though is that i never got to sit down sort of and talk to him about that i talked to some of my professors about it but i wanted i would have loved to have known sort of his experiences more um because yeah for me i see him as an artistic pioneer but i also see him as a, a pioneer in that regard that he made it easier for those Chamorros who would work at the university, who would come after. Um, and I appreciated that. Even though I ended up leaving the University of Guam, uh, I definitely sort of appreciate what him and others did ahead of me. He was, I, I, I was always intimidated by, by Adriano because of his stature, you know, being like the trailblazer for a lot of the local artists. And, and you know, only the, the, the first to, to, to be in academia at, at the professorship level and Joe Babata being the second and me being the third. So, I, you know, I've, I felt like, hey, I'm finally part of this club. <laughs> so, so I could actually talk to him as my equal in a way. And it was very liberating for me because we became friends that year. And, and he, the guy, he, he never stopped making me laugh. His sense of humor was so... Uh, it was different. <laughs> it, it was it was kind of uh, um, 
there, yeah, I, I, I just can't explain it. It was raw. It was very raw. Yeah, and and、uh, but but he just, I just remember him, and and you know what's funny too is he would talk about、uh, uh, my 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 colleague, my pari, see Joe, because they had this kind of rivalry going also between those two, you know, and I always laughed at that because.、Um, There was so much respect between those two. I know, and and they would be so critical of each other. Having to get to know him and his personality, and、uh, and 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 his age, the fact that he was much much older than me, but he was very,、um, he was a trendy in terms of the way he thought about art. It, it was he was very、uh, young and contemporary in, in his thinking of of what art is. And what it's about, and and so I could I I try to tap into that, you know, tap into his his thinking on that, and、um, and just you know kind of borrow what I like, you know, in terms of 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 the、uh, the dialogue that we have about the local arts and stuff, and and、um, uh, but the one thing I I knew about Adriano was his his level of of、um, uh, what do they call that the His own personal requirements of what he deemed was was good. <laughs> he had high standards, so so there was. He never came out and said, "I really like your work." He never said that to me, <laughs> but he always showed up at my my solo shows, and 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 I, every time he would show up, I say, "Hey, you made it! You made it!" I was so honored to see him, and sometimes he came in like a day late, <laughs> and I said,、hey, "You're late, man." <laughs> And I think there's only one time where he came in, and I was deinstalling the, the show, but he still came, you know. And he was he would yell at me for not sending him the invitation, and I said, "No, it was just a public invitation." But I, I always knew that if I had a show, I had to invite him; otherwise, I would never hear the end of it, you know. One thing about Adriano, he didn't talk much about it, but. He showed his love for Guam through his art. You could see village scenes, like、uh, I can remember seeing Tuman in one of his paintings. You see, he lived in Tuman, and then the vegetation, the trees, the barbecues, all those village scenes that he is part of Guam. That's that's what he related to. That's all I knew was he he did have this great love for Guam, and that was what's different about it. It was a positive thing. It's probably why he used those glorious colors that he he always managed to incorporate and make part. It was always part of his composition. He was a master of that, and probably it was. Part of his love too. The colors he used, like my mom said, my father did not express much through words and conversations, but you could see it in his artwork. It was apparent that he did love his island, and he did love the people of Guam, and he loved the culture, which、uh, I think should be carried on, and the traditions should be carried on. Uh, life has changed a lot since I was a child in the '70s, and、uh, that's something that we will always see when we look at his artwork.
As a defense attorney, I have represented many people who, if they weren't poor or they had received a higher education, may have taken a different path. As senator, I will propose a scholarship for those whose struggles are less academic and more financial. Let's keep our university full, not our prison. I'm Thomas Fisher. I not only approved this message, I wrote it. Paid for by Tom for Guam, Drake Diaz, Treasurer. Candid, The Point, and the Guam Daily Post are proud to present another Platform 2022 debate. Lieutenant Governor Josh Tenorio and Lieutenant Governor Candidate Sabrina Salas Matanani. Phil Leon Guerrero and Monticelva Tyron will present topics and issues of concern to every Guamanian. July 20th at 6 p.m. everywhere. Broadcast, simulcast, and webcast on Facebook, Candid News, and on the air at 93.3 FM and on KGTF. Platform 2022 from Candid, the Guam Daily Post, and 93.3 the point.